1880 to about, let's say, 1950, the period of the second imperialism, the period when Europeans completed their conquest of essentially every square meter of the globe, a period of tremendous optimism, a period where most educated people, at least at the beginning of this period, in the late 19th century, took for granted that the ideas of the future were universalistic, that they were liberal, or that they were socialist, a period when people took for granted that further technology would bring further enlightenment. Now, this, 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 this first globalization is useful for us to remember because of what's similar which I've already suggested. I hope you already feel this resemblance that in the 1880s and 1890s, there was general confidence that ideas like nationalism were things of the past, just like in the 1980s and 1990s, there was general optimism that these kinds of ideas were, were of the past. And then there are a few things that are, that are different. One of them, I think very fundamental but often overlooked, is hydrocarbons, natural gas oil, coal. You didn't expect me to say that, but it's extremely important. In the first globalization, hydrocarbons were all about the future. Hydrocarbons were about how trains and planes and automobiles were going to be possible. They were about how human mobility was going to become easy. Now in our globalization, hydrocarbons mean something else entirely. Back then, hydrocarbons meant the future. Now, hydrocarbons mean something like the past. A past of emitting, right, of emitting carbon dioxide into the air for 100 years. A past which is now catching up to us with fires in California, or with droughts in Syria, or with droughts in Libya, with migrants to, the, to Europe, right? Hydrocarbons now mean something else. Hydrocarbons mean a past which is now weighing on us very heavily. Here's another difference between the first globalization and our globalization. Humans. In the first globalization, what democracy meant was you have a democratic regime in the center of your empire, and then in the rest of the empire, you have second-class citizens or people who are not citizens at all. Right? So Great Britain, um, which as you know, used to be a major power, it's soon going to not exist at all, so we should you know, talk about it while we can. Um, Great Britain has the longest, you think that's a joke, but this is being recorded, and you know, you can, in, in five years, you can treat this as a prediction. Um, Great, in Great Britain, which has the longest and strongest democratic tradition in Europe, was of course an empire, and democracy and liberalism applied to some people at the core of the empire, but of course not to the periphery. And this is completely normal. The way that democracy worked in the first globalization, and this is true of America too, is it applied to certain people at the center, but it didn't apply to the periphery. One of the things which is different and challenging about our globalization is that in general, that kind of imperialism is over. If you, in other words, if you want to have democracy, you can't send the people who don't like it somewhere else. In America, we, we had a social contract on the East Coast it was called the Constitution, and people who didn't like it could go off and conquer territory further west. In Great Britain, people, people could go to Africa or to Asia, right? That's the way the first globalization worked. Democracy may be a little bit at the center, but imperialism and conquest everywhere else. Ironically, the only, the only place where this wasn't true is here, it's in, in the Habsburg monarchy. You're now busy celebrating 100 years of liberation from the Habsburg monarchy, which I find, in a way, very curious. Um, in the world of empire, the Habsburg monarchy was the only empire which took democratization and liberalism seriously. Okay, now, the, 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 the reason I'm bringing up globalization is so that we can feel that not everything is new, that some things are a bit new, that some things are a bit old. Um, we have the same basic arc, which is that optimism about universal ideas crashes at a certain moment. And in that moment where optimism crashes, other ideas come rushing in. 
In the 1920s and 1930s, this was very dramatic. Those ideas were not just nationalism, which comes in from the Balkans and spreads through Europe. Those ideas were also Leninism, and then fascism, and then national socialism. In our globalization, the ideas that have come rushing in are milder or less serious. When people ask me, for example, if Donald Trump is a fascist, my answer is that he's not even a fascist. Right? <laughs> Right? It, it's not that he's, it's, I wouldn't want to say that he's not a fascist. It's that he doesn't meet all of the necessary criteria. He doesn't work hard enough, for example, um, to, 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 be, to be a fascist. Um, and, and this is, this is, this is, this is character, I think this is characteristic of our, of our period. That, think about, think about fiction, okay? So in the 1920s and 1930s, when people lost faith in the factual world. Where did they go? They went to the grand narrative of nationalism, and they went to the even grander narratives of totalitarianism. After, after 2008, people in general, I mean, some people go to a grand narrative of nationalism, but not with such conviction, I don't think. And the grander narratives of totalitarianism are not with us. We have fictions, but the fictions are half-hearted. The fictions don't even pretend to be grand narratives. Fascism had the fiction of the leader and the united people, right? We have fictions like Barack Obama was born in, in Africa. Fictions that are big enough to make trouble for the real world, but which don't quite compete for the real world, which, to use a very popular word, word which disrupt. So if you think about how Russian propaganda versus the European Union or versus the United States works, it doesn't actually provide any other grand story. It just launches into your discourses medium-sized lies that are big enough to confuse and disrupt and delay, but which don't pretend to be grand stories that explain everything. So, and here's another difference, and this one's, I think, really important. After the Great Depression, so I focused on National Socialism and Fascism, but after the Great Depression and after the Second World War, democracies did find ways of defending themselves. One of those ways was the welfare state, both in the United States and in Europe. The welfare state was a way of democracy to defend itself. Another was European integration. This was a way for democracy to defend itself. Characteristic of our moment is that after 2008, after the beginning of the financial crisis, no one defended democracy. No one came up with grand ways that democracy should defend itself, right? So just as the totalitarianism is sort of half-hearted, the defense of democracy is also half-hearted, or, or to put it better, basically non-existent. No one came up after 2008 with ways of handling the problems that 2008 revealed. Okay, so how should we think about all this? The way that I think is most revealing to think about this is in terms of time. So if we ask, is this one road to unfreedom or many, I, I think the answer is both. I think there is an overall pattern, and within that pattern there are variations. What is the thing that holds all of the new authoritarian regimes together? I think it has to do with time. Where, where is the future? I don't mean the immediate future, like that you really need to smoke a cigarette or you know, your girlfriend didn't show up for this lecture and you need to find her. I mean, where... Why did only women smile when I made that joke? <laughs> That's really giving me pause for thought. <laughs> um, what I mean is, where is the notion of what the world will look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line? We don't seem to have that. And that's, a, that's, tr that's surprising in a way, because for the last 300 years or so, politics in the West has been all about the future. And now that we've reached a point where, in objective quantitative terms, we have so more wealth, more technology than any other time, we seem to be completely unable to talk about the future. This seems to me to be the fundamental fact of politics. How did we get there? I think it has to do with the way that an optimistic version of time dies. So an optimistic version of time, what I call in the book, the politics of inevitability, progress, that history's over, there are no alternatives, the market's gonna bring democracy, right? A story like that, which makes you feel like the future is going to be more of the present, and that there are rules according to which time flows forward, those stories break, right? 
our, our, we had a story like that after 1989, and it has broken. When that story breaks, the very tempting alternative is to shift from faith in progress to a belief in doom. And I think this is the basic move which has been made from Russia to the United States and pretty much everywhere else in between in different ways. Rather than being sure that the future is predictable, you give up on the future entirely. Having convinced yourself that the future was coming regardless of what you do, you then convince yourself that things are gonna go badly regardless of what you do. Rather than trying to articulate what a new future would look like, you start talking about the migrants, the Jews, whoever it might be, who are eternally trying to cause your nation, your group, trouble, right? This is what I call in the book, The Politics of Eternity. And this is everywhere now. It goes under various names. It goes under the name of making America great again. It, on this continent, it very often goes under the name of memory, which is one of my least favorite things in the world. Um, but I think this is the general problem that you go from one story about time where you're powerless but it doesn't matter because everything's going to be good to another version of time where you're powerless and it doesn't matter because everything's going to be bad. And in between, what gets lost is the question of agency and responsibility and actually history. Because what is history? History actually is a form of political thought. Um, history says time flows forward that knowing about the past enables you to act in the present, that the future is uncertain and depends partly on your knowledge of the structures that you live in and also the choices you make about navigating those structures. In other words, history is a view of time which is neither automatic progress nor cyclical doom. Um, so history strikes me as the thing which has gotten lost and as the thing that we, the, the thing that we need. And therefore, and this is the last thing I wanna say, therefore, because there's no history, we're constantly surprised. We're surprised by Brexit. We're surprised by Trump. Um, we're surprised every day by Trump. We're surprised that we're surprised. Oh, it's still funny for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're, we're surprised that we're surprised that Russians get to choose the American president. Um, we're surprised by all kinds of things. And the reason why we're surprised is because being surprised itself is, is a form, is a luxury, right? Being surprised is a way of saying, well, what can I do? This is all new. What can, I, what can I possibly do? And the next move after shock is helplessness, right? Shock is pre-helplessness. So when you're surprised, what you're saying is, oh, the story of how everything was predictable and getting better turns out not to be true. And the surprise is the transitory moment before you go to, okay, well, there's nothing I can do about it. Right? And by the way, it's, and it's the migrant's fault. Right? That's the next thing you say. No, that is the next thing you say. You, don't think, you may not think so now because you're so young, as I mentioned before, but that's the next thing you say. Shock is pre-helplessness. So if you find yourself being shocked, you have to say, okay, do I now assert agency and responsibility or do I keep being shocked every day until I decide that I'm helpless and it's someone else's fault. And this, by the way, is the way the politics of eternity works in practice. So consider Mr. Trump. Consider him seriously now, because he's not a joke. He's a very talented politician who represents, I think, the mainstream of politics in our time. How does Mr. Trump practice the politics of eternity? There are two big loops. One is to say, let's make America great again. Let's refer back to a mythical past. And this is common here, too, very common here. All of you have your institutes of memory. All of you have your mythical pasts. All of you have your completely indefensible national histories that make no sense, but which you're taught anyway, right? You all have that. So one thing is to say, make America great again. A big historical loop back to a mythical moment when things were better. And by the way, the social scientists have usefully ascertained when America was great. Um, America turns out to be great when we were young. <laughs> Not surprisingly. The second way Mr. Trump is a politician of eternity, and this is important, is the, the way he uses technology. So our internet, our, our, our globalization is different from the previous one also because of the technology in question. The internet is a masquerade of the future, which in fact drives your head into the past. 
The internet pretends to be something which has something to do with the future. But in fact, what it's best able to do is to disable the more enlightened parts of your mind and enable the less enlightened parts of your mind. What the internet is most capable of doing thus far anyway, maybe it'll do great things in the future. But what the internet has mainly done so far is to de-enlighten us. It's, it's made us much more capable of, of looking at the world the way machines look at the world, which is a quick series of yes-no choices, of binary choices. What makes me feel good right now? What makes me feel like clicking right now? And that information, which is essentially information about your biology, is then passed into a network, right? Which is, I'm sad to say, much smarter than you. And that network then reinforces those impulses in you. Mr. Trump is a master at this. He uses this technology for basically its main purpose, which is the second part of the politics of eternity. He makes it impossible for us to think about the future by pounding our emotions every day, right? This also makes the future go away. The future goes away because there's a big loop into this undefined past, this thing which we call here in Central Europe memory, and then also because there's this daily loop, right? And the consequence is that we can't think about facts and we can't think, and we can't think about the future. So, um, the question, I mean, the big question, this is where I'll stop. In some sense, the question of the road to unfreedom is, why does Russia get to elect the American president? But that, you know, which I take to be a serious question, not only as an American, but as an observer of politics in general. But that question leads us to, some, to I think, m many more interesting places than, than Putin and Trump and all of this, right? In a few years, I'm gonna betray a big secret. In a few years, neither of these guys is gonna be in power. Right? Um, big secret. No, that's the big secret of authoritarianism. We're in the early sexy phase of authoritarianism, right? The reason why authoritarianism looks good now is that these guys come on the stage and they break all the rules, right? They break all the rules. And that seems really cool until they get old and they die. And their countries have no succession mechanism. And their countries fall apart and then it looks less cool, but by then it's too late because we've all followed their examples and become authoritarians ourselves, so we can do the same thing, right? So, um, okay, so, all right. So where I was going with this was, with, with, with Russia and Trump is an example of, of the larger problem, right? Russia is only important because Russia is the hyper-typical example of where we are. In Russia, there can't be the future. Why can't there be the future in Russia? For, for every reason which I've tried to outline. Hydrocarbons. If you are a hydrocarbon oligarch, whether you're American or Russian, you don't talk about the future because the future is climate change and it's your fault personally. If you are, um, the second reason there's no future in Russia, extreme inequality of wealth. The radical left-wing organization Cuddy Suisse, which does an annual, thank you, the, which does an annual wealth survey, ranks one country as having greater wealth inequality than the United States, and that is, of course, the Russian Federation. Wealth inequality means lack of social advancement. Lack of social advancement means inability to see the future, which means you have to govern from some place besides the future. Third reason why there's no future in Russia I just mentioned is succession problem. No one knows what's going to happen when Mr. Putin dies, and no one in Russia is allowed to raise that question. Right? So Russia has to govern from futurelessness. How do you govern from futurelessness? You govern by way of mistrust. When there's no future, there can't be facts. And so you govern at home by not, incur by not discouraging mistrust, but by encouraging it. You say, yes, you don't trust us, you, sh you shouldn't trust us, just don't trust anybody else. When there's no future, there can't be facts. Right? And the Russian foreign policy towards you and towards the United States is based on the same premise. It's not trying to get us towards any future. This is how this globalization is different from the last one. The last one was full of futures. It's just trying to get you towards a moment where you don't believe in anything. Where you think you're smart because you don't believe in anything. Because as soon as you don't believe in anything, then the future goes away, right? If you don't believe in facts, you can't encounter your fellow citizens on the basis of, basis of facts. If you don't believe in facts, you can't make policy on the basis of facts. And if you don't believe in facts, right, you actually you won't do anything, right? You won't do anything. 
And, and so this brings us to where I want to leave, since in some sense, you know, we're, 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 we're talking about Patochka the whole time. Aiming towards factuality is the way of aiming towards a future. It's also a way of resisting the morass and the inertia, which is, which is the shape of the globalization that we're in. Okay, that's all I wanted to say for now, and I'm gonna leave it to Pablo. Thank you. So I, I don't know if uh, uh, if my if my talk uh, will be complementary or antagonistic. Maybe rather complementary, uh, uh, even if I think that um, we should be more careful about generalizing uh, this phenomenon. Uh, this phenomenon uh, which we are speaking about. I mean, uh, I think there is a the challenge, intellectual challenge of, of those anti-democratic or anti-liberal or authoritarian or neo-imperialist movements uh, which span across the globe is exactly they, they resemble a lot, but at the same time uh, there are specificities and it's difficult, to, it's difficult to subsume all of them under one moment, uh, under one model. So I first think uh, very few people in this region are talking about non-European authoritarian leaders, uh, but there are many of them. I mean, at least three should be interest in interesting for us uh, because they are very important, like J Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, Norendra Modi in <coughs> India, or Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines. All those three guys have something similar to Donald Trump, to Putin, to Erdogan. But they are also different. And um, I also think that they are different from European neo-nationalist authoritarians. They are similar, but they are different. But they shouldn't be probably put under the same, under the same uh, model. And I also think this is the first uh, very soft criticism that, that Russia is a <clears throat> category of its own. It's a Wigenerist category. I don't believe that, uh, that we can build a model which would cover Putin and Kaczynski and Orban as one, uh, as one, uh, you know, one category uh, where we will be able to uh, reduce all of them to a set of common features. I don't believe in that. But I believe that within Europe and within Central Europe, uh, we can basically do this work. Uh, uh, I, I would uh, use the term neo-nationalism or populism interchangeably, I will explain why. And I will have, um, uh, I will try to, uh, uh, to make five or six uh, very short uh, points which are, which will be my provisos, uh, how to approach uh, this phenomenon maybe what to do uh, what to do about that and I will have in mind only only neo-nationalism in Europe and in um, central uh, in central Europe first uh, I think we should acknowledge that uh, and uh, the most general point of departure is the same as Tim's I think that all those movements are actually a reaction to the last, to the second wave of globalization, economic, political, culture. Uh, they can be conceived as a sort of backlash against uh, that globalization. In that, I think uh, there is a consensus uh, between us. Okay, first, I think we should acknowledge that uh, some of those movements are illiberal, but not necessarily anti-democratic. Uh, especially this populist aspect of this, the people, the, the most of them would put, would pit rather, the people against the global elites, the people supposedly territorial, you know, one culture uh, against the uprooted elite, which are global, which are living uh, everywhere and nowhere, so they don't represent the people. I think this, this very point, which sometimes is already rejected as something suspicious, 
should be accepted as legitimate because the point is actually to, to, to point out that the elites don't represent the people actually uh, refers to the basic democratic principle, okay? That the elite should represent the people. So those claims might be wrong, but they are not illegitimate in itself. Second point. Uh, the same uh, what I said about the populist aspect of, of those movements could be said about nationalist aspect. Nationalism in itself is not anti-democratic. Actually, we could say the opposite. We could say that without uh, democracy, there would be no nationalism and vice versa. Both, both developed in the 19th century and nationalism, uh, the democratic, uh, actually, the nationalism was based on the democratic idea. Uh, without the idea of the sovereignty of the people and its self-rule, there would be no idea of a sovereignty of a particular people living on this territory, having this language, this culture. Uh, okay, third point. We should distinguish demagogues who use the grievances of the losers of globalization uh, from those grievances themselves and look for an anti-authoritarian response uh, to them. Fourth, uh, not only nationalists and populists, but also liberals can represent a challenge to democracy. There have always, uh, always been liberals, such as, for instance, Friedrich von Hayek before World War II, who defended the transnational federalism against the nation state exactly because they wanted to defend uh, certain privileges of economic elites against the will of the people. Okay, so the fourth thesis is that liberals can pose the challenge to democracy as much as nationalists and populists. Another example which I think uh, will Tim like because we all, we both like John Stuart Mill so, of course, uh, Hayek was defending economic elites, but John Stuart Mill is famous for uh, suggesting uh, that the votes of the educated should be given greater weight than those of uneducated. Okay, that's another anti-democratic, anti liberally motivated uh, thesis. And I heard this quite recently in the Czech Republic by well-known liberals reacting to the Brexit, saying that the Brexit referendum by saying, well, maybe the common people shouldn't decide about such important issues, okay? That was what something which I would call demophobic, <laughs> demophobic reaction. So I think there is something like liberal demophobia. Uh, uh, it's very dangerous, which brings me to democracy, which brings me to my fifth point. The difference between elites, by which I mean classes endowed with economic, culture, and social capital, and the common people, by which I mean classes without those kinds of capital, is not a fantasy of populist demagogues. This difference, this division, uh, exists in reality, not only in material terms, but also in the in terms of value orientations. Because elites are gifted with resources, they tend to stress the value of meritocracy and individual freedom, while people without resources, on the other hand, tend to rely on more collectivistic way how to better their situation. Uh, collectivistic solidarity, mobilization for the redistribution or for you know, the state to express their collective identity or their dignity or some big organization like political party. Remember the slogan, dignity of labor, which was around 100 years ago when uh, Austrian social democracy led by Viktor Adler was fighting for the universal suffrage. Dignity of labor it was something which was fought for by collective means, big demonstrations, not by individual self realize individual education and, uh, and something like that. So those two positions, of course it's schematic, it's ideal typical, but uh, those two positions uh, can be con conceived as, uh, as two kinds of 
two roads to emancipation, two kinds of emancipatory um, behavior or conduct. One is individualistic, it places the center of gravity in the civil society, which should be liberated, left alone, liberated from the state, left alone by, by the state. Another is collectivistic, placing the center of gravity in the state's capacity to control societal pr processes and to protect the common people against the elite. Sixth, and the final one, my thesis is that democracy should be based on a balanced combination of those two kinds of emancipation. So, if we are democrat, we should be afraid as much of the populist nationalists who promise to the common people to build an authoritarian state, as of liberals who defend freedom of elites from any state control or interference. Uh, so Democrats, that is, should not fall into the trap of the Manichaean opposition between meritocratic individualism on the one hand and egalitarian collectivism on the other, or between civil society and state, or between personal freedom and social solidarity. So this is, this is the layout of, of, the, of my basic assumption. Now, may I had uh, what I wanted to do was to confronted with, with some of uh, Tim has written in his book, but I will shorten that because I think it would be more interesting. And I will select only one basic point. Uh, uh, where I think we differ. Uh, we, uh, maybe I should first say when we are complete, uh, in complete agreement. Uh, namely, in the statement that unregulated capitalism of the last 40, 50 years brought about great social inequalities, which, as he says in the last chapter of his book, uh, led to the replacement of democracy with oligarchy. So that one structural reason why we have problems, why democracy is in the crisis, and I agree completely with that. All the more so, I was surprised that in the, the first chapter actually is falling into the trap, first chapter of his book, is falling into the trap which I said we should avoid. Remember what I said <laughs> a while ago, we should avoid the trap between, uh, you know, to, to choose between individual freedom and social solidarity, civil society and the state, and so on and so forth. And the first chapter of his book, of his last book, is entitled Individualism or Totalitarianism, where he follows the basic assumptions of, uh, of a tradition of the 20th century which I would call anti-totalitarian liberalism. And this tradition, which begins with Hayek, actually, he, uh, you hints at Hayek with the title of your book, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the Road to Serfdom, to Road to Unfreedom. Uh, but the first chapter <clears throat> actually confirms the suspicion of those who saw the title first and thought immediately of Hayek's book. Namely, you follow this tendency to put, again I repeat, the tendency of what I would call anti-totalitarian liberalism of the 20th century, which has many, uh, many faces. I mean, the first generation, Karl Popper, Friedrich Hayek in the 40s, 50s, but then there is, seven, in the 70s and 80s, uh, basically two distinct uh, faces of this kind of liberalism. One is economic liberalism, another is the liberalism of civil society and human rights. And um, all those actually, uh, for instances which I just mentioned, have something common. They put individual freedom against collectivistic values, and those values then associate with the totalitarian state. So they end up in this 
dichotomy and mannequin dichotomy between individual freedom and social solidarity. Uh, so that would be uh, one point of friction when I would simply argue that our challenge today is not to end up here. Because that's exactly what the populist and nationalists want. Because then we, went, we end up as the defenders of the privileges of the elites, of educated elites. Uh, who, of course, value individual freedom, meritocratic competition, civil society, uh, the state which doesn't interfere, because this is what, you know, what they need. Uh, a defender of those against the common people, people who are not so educated, who cannot really compete on the global market, who need the protection of the state, and who, who need uh, very often uh, social solidarity which is mediated by the state and I know you, you would agree maybe with that with that last sentence but I'm puzzled why then you pitted the value of individual freedom against totalitarianism and under totalitarianism you, you subsumed all, all kinds of or at least associated with totalitarianism, the collective solidarity, and all kinds of political and social theories which are holistic, for instance, Hegelianism or Marxism. And that's again Popperian gesture, of course, right? That, that makes you an anti totalitarian liberal of the 20th century. Why I think, and that will be my last point, why I think it's wrong is that. Uh, the beast we are fighting now is different from the beast we fought in the 70s and 80s of the 20th century. Uh, at that time, and I was actually one of those who would defend anti-totalitarian liberalism. I, was, uh, I actually signed the manifesto in 88, which was called uh, Democracy for Everybody or for All. Uh, and uh, the movement was called the Movement for, uh, of Civic Solidarity. Okay. Not social solidarity, but civic solidarity, which is impor an important difference. Okay. Uh, because the civic solidarity, of course, it is okay for, for the middle class educated people. Uh, they don't need the state, they need the, 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 the free space to be able to organize themselves and to follow their, their interests and their, uh, their trajectories. Uh, uh, so my criticism is a criticism from within that tradition. But I think today we are 40 years after and we should take into account that this kind of anti-totalitarian movements actually won in the 90s and, the, uh, in the 90s and 2000s and, and were part of the dismantlement uh, of the welfare state in the West. They, indirectly or directly participated in this neoliberal revolution. So um, that would be, that would be uh, the question and the objection uh, to your general framework. But otherwise, I think in the most general outline, our position overlap quite strongly. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to agree with both myself and with Pavel at the same time. Uh, I, I, I agree with everything that Pavel says pretty much except the characterization of my book, uh, which, which is where I'm going to start. So I don't, I don't mind at all being an anti-totalitarian liberal. I think being anti-totalitarian is good. I think being liberal is also good. There are several more things that I think you have to be in order to be anti-totalitarian and liberal. And this is where I'm going to try to stretch to agree with, with, with Pavel. So my view is that, I mean, what, the way I would characterize my own view would be as a pluralist. That is, 
I think, I think that there are many good things in the world and that the job of politics is to reconcile as many of them as possible and that both liberalism and democracy along with the rule of law and social justice are ways of keeping several good things going at the same time. So in my book, it's true that the first chapter is called individualism and totalitarianism, but then the next four chapters have in their titles succession, integration, um, truth, and equality, which are among the virtues which I take to be necessary for good modern politics. And I think that those five things are, are all simultaneously under threat. That is, individualism and equality can be simultaneously under threat, and they can also simultaneously support one another. They need not be put into contradiction. So while I agree with Pavel's historical point that one can use a certain kind of liberalism against a certain kind of egalitarianism, the fact that I'm for individualism does not mean that I'm against egalitarianism, right? I mean, if I were 30 years younger and we were the Heritage Foundation, or older, sorry, um, yeah, it would. But I think I agree with you that we're now living in a different world, and that's why I start the book the way that I did. So the chat, I was trying not to talk about my book because I try very hard not to assume that people have read my books. I think it's always very pompous when like Pete, you say, oh, you've read my book, of course, so now let's talk about footnote 433. Um, I, I try to give you a very general introduction, but the first chapter, the first chapter which, which Pablo cites is actually about totalitarianism. It's about the return of totalitarian thought in the 21st century. It's about a particular totalitarian thinker, um, a Russian Christian fascist whose name was Ivan Ilin, who happens to be the, the, the philosopher who has been most brought back into politics in the 21st century. And I start from that phenomenon for a couple of reasons. The first is that I think ideas matter a lot. Um, I'm trying very much to get out from under this, you know, if you want neoliberal assumption that ideas don't matter, that there are no ideas, history is over. I was trying to work against the standard Western reaction to everything Mr. Putin does, which is, well, after all, he's just a pragmatist. And the thing is that, that when you say, after all, he's just a pragmatist, what you mean is he just cares about money. And if he just cares about money, then for all, he's rational. And if he's rational, everything will turn out okay in the end. And what I was trying to say is something like, when you already have $60 billion, you don't care about money the same way that, let's say, students care about money. You might start to care about other things. There's a point, I mean, to go back to Hegel, where quantity becomes quality. And that point, I think, is somewhere before $60 billion. So what, what I was trying to do is to show how old, far-right ideas from the 20s and 30s can come back to protect oligarchy, which is what they're doing. So in my view, this fascism that we have, or this is, is kind of what the Marxists thought, I'm now gonna outflank you on the left, is kind of what the Marxists thought it was the last time around. That's what I think is happening. So with someone like Putin, what is Putin? He is the chief oligarch of a hydrocarbon oligarchy. How does fascism work in the Russian Federation? Well, what Mr. Ilin says, is the following. It's a very interesting view. The world is entirely flawed. There's nothing true in the world. God created the world and that was a mistake. Um, hence, there's nothing true in the factual sense. There's no such thing as factual truth. The only true thing is God. God broke himself by creating the world. And here comes the important part. The only way to recover God is by way of Russia. And so anything which helps Russia is helping God. And then you see, I'm simplifying a little bit, but you see how this links up to the 21st century. Because our 21st century, if you like, left-wing postmodern idea that there's no factual truth in the world, right? That it's all just your opinion and my opinion. Someone like Vladislav Surkov in Russia can use Ilin, which he does, to justify this postmodern attitude, but not in a liberatory sense. Right? Not that we're all free because you can think what you think and I think what I think, but in an oppressive sense. We have all the money, therefore we control the television stations, right? and therefore we're going to give you six false views every night. Right? And you can choose between those six false views, but you're never going to get to the truth. But it doesn't matter because there's no truth. And the way it works in Russian foreign policy is the same way. 
we're not doing anything wrong if we help the British to think that Brexit's a good idea. We're not doing anything wrong if we tell African Americans that Hillary Clinton is a racist, because there's no truth anyway. There's nothing wrong there. As long as it helps Russia, it's fine, right? And so what I'm trying to show is that actual fascist ideas from the 20s and 30s are coming back in, a, in an oligarchical form. Because ultimately, what these ideas do, not just Eileen, but other 20th century fascist ideas and the way they work in Russia now, what they do is they allow an oligarchy to perpetuate itself. They allow a condition of extreme wealth and equality to become normal because they justify futurelessness, right? Liberalism and democracy and every progressive idea you can think of require a future. The thing which doesn't require a future is a racial oligarchy or some, some other form of oligarchy where politics becomes a permanent us and them, what I call the politics of eternity. So, I mean, my, I mean it, it, it could be that in some deep sense, like psychoanalytically, you're right and I'm wrong, but I can tell you what I intend to do, which is I intend to explain how old fascist ideas and new oligarchy can go together. Um, because this is the interesting difference between the 21st century and the 20th, is that both the far right and the liberals accept radical inequality. This is the difference, okay? The, even the fascists redistributed. They redistributed from Jews and minorities to others, but they believed in redistribution. The New Deal liberals believed in redistribution. The Stalinists believed in redistribution, right? Everybody believed in redistribution. This time around, who believes in redistribution? The far right is saying oligarchy is cool at least a lot of the far right. And the, the liberals are saying, you know, what can we do about it? Equality's just, inequality is just normal. So this is, this is why I begin the chapter, the book, the way that I do, because I think that old fascist ideas can be and are being motivated, used to justify contemporary inequality. Okay, I'm just gonna respond very briefly to, to Pavel's other points. Um, First of all, so you, you don't remember what Pavel's five points are, so I can now just go one, two, three, four, five, and let's just pretend that my one, two, three, four, five is the same as Pavel's one, two, three, four, five, right? <laughs> let's just pretend that my one is a response to his one, and so on. Um, so, so number one, I think what's special, so Pavel made the point quite rightly that, that we have Brazil, we have India, I would of course add China, which is the most important country um, that we haven't mentioned. Um, I think there's something special about Europe though, and what's special about Europe is that the return to democracy, or the arrival of democracy, I would even say, in the post-war period was collective. That is, it involves and is, is indissolubly connected with the process of European integration. And therefore, attacks on European integration are also attacks on democracy, and the attacks on democracy are also attacks on European integration. You notice that there's a very close overlap. People who oppose European integration are usually or often against democracy and vice versa. The second thing I wanted to say, Pavel made the point that there are people who are democratic but not liberal. Here I would, here I would say this is, I think, less common than it seems. I think this whole category of illiberal democracy doesn't really appear in real life very much because it's true that it's true that these illiberal Democrats, this is Fareed Zakaria's term, which Viktor Orban has then picked up, it's true that they talk about the people. But, Pavel hinted at this too, they don't actually mean everybody when they say the people. When they say the people, they mean the correct people, right? So when Mr. Trump says the people, I mean, it's he, he actually uses the phrase, the people that matter, or the right people, right? Um, and which means the white people, by the way, in case you hadn't caught up, right? So he means, so when Mr. Trump says the people, he does not mean the citizens of the United States or the inhabitants of the United States. He means some people, right? And that is, of course, an old fascist trick. When Hitler said das Volk, he didn't mean the citizens of Germany or the people on the territory of Germany. He meant uh, ethnic Germans who think the right way, right? So this whole business of the people can, be, can become an us and them strategy. And, and you know, in the, in the United States, this has progressed very far, where we don't even think about the rest of the world because we have our enemies inside the country already. Democrats and Republicans think that each other are the greatest threat to the sovereignty of the country. Only one of them can be right, by the way. Um, one of them is right, but the, the Democrats and Republicans think of themselves as being the greatest threat to the sovereignty of, of the United States of America. In other words, the us, the us and them can be pushed very far. And the thing is, the people who are illiberal Democrats, they tend to end up messing with democracy. So you, you end up, you have elections, 
But the sad, tragic thing is that everybody knows the elections don't matter. And the tricky thing is you don't know at which moment they stop mattering, right? The, um, this, in Russia is already well across that line, but people still vote. Hungary is across that line, but people still vote. And in the United States of America, um, where we allow our states to pass voter suppression laws, um, this is one of the new developments in the United States since 2013, it's okay to have voter suppression according to the Supreme Court. Um, we, we, one of the, 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 the largest stakes in the last American elections were, does voter suppression work? If you make it very hard for black people and Hispanics to vote, does that work, right? Um, so we have 22 states which in the last five years have passed laws with the deliberate purpose of preventing people from voting. This may not be noticed, but this is what, this is what illiberal Democrats do. They keep the voting, right? But they make it harder for certain kinds of people so that the right kind of people end up, end up always winning. The third thing I wanted to say has to do with, with populism. Some of these guys maybe, I don't know what populism is anymore, if I ever did. Um, it's a word that we use a lot. But what I do know is that populism has to have something to do, as Pavel's next point suggests, it has to have something to do with the collective interests and maybe the economic interests of, of, of a significant part of the population. But in this sense, Donald Trump is obviously not a populist. Um, consider the wall. What is the wall? What is build that wall? Build that wall is a slogan which was thought up by non-citizens of the United States working for an international corporation um, inside the United Kingdom, tested with Facebook on a broad section of the population and discovered to be resonant. That is what build that wall is. Is there an actual wall? No, there is no actual wall. Will they ever build an actual wall? No, of course they will not build an actual wall because that would require work. Someone would have to get up in the morning and write a law and other people would have to go build the wall, right? What do we actually have on the US-Mexican border? There's not a wall. There's never gonna be a wall. What do we actually have? We have a series of wall samples. So um, if you've ever built a kitchen, you know that an important stage is the part where you go choose the tile, right? Oh, I like that one with the seahorses, but my wife likes the one, you know, that has the angels. That's the stage where we are with the wall. Every so often, Mr. Trump goes to the U.S.-Mexican border, and there are giant tiles. And he gets out of his car and he says, oh, I like the gray of that one. Oh, but that one has a threatening corrugated look, right? <laughs> That's the wall. There is no wall, there won't be a wall. I'm making a point here, and the point is that they, he talks about, and he won because of, real economic grievances. But his policy is to make them worse, and then to run on them a second time. I'm not saying it's gonna work, but this is the idea. He's not against inequality, he's obviously for inequality. He, I mean, he, he would like inequality to extend to himself because he would very much like to be rich which he's not, by the way, but he wants to be rich. He wants for there to be more inequality between himself and the rest of us. That is the central goal of his presidency. Um, he failed as a businessman. His father gave him $340 million, right? If I gave you $340 million, you would be rich. Mr. Trump got $340 million. He's not rich, which tells you all you need to know about his business career. Um, but, the, the, but, but the point is that there's something else going on here, which, which in the book I call sadopopulism. That is, you're, you're governing from pain and you're not going to try to resolve that pain. You're gonna to try to make it worse. Well, I think we see this in Brexit too, um, in, in particular with Boris Johnson. He know, Boris Johnson knows that Brexit is a disaster. He's been, he was against it all his life until he was for it. But now that it's gonna, he thinks it's gonna happen, he's looking forward to the moment when Britain falls apart. Because then he's already looking forward to blaming the French and you know, blaming the European Union, et cetera, for the idiotic decision that his own party made. Um, that's what he's looking forward to. He, there's no way that the Tories are going to use Brexit to bring about social justice for the British people. That is a scenario which I am happy to exclude from, because that's just not gonna happen. They're in favor of it because they want Britain to be a neoliberal paradise, right? This is what I mean by sadopopulism. So you can appeal to people's sense of economic grievance, which certainly happened in Brexit too, while intending at the same time to make it worse, right? That's, that, and that's not populism, not in the traditional sense, which brings me to Pavel's next point, which is about solving real economic grievances. Absolutely, that's what the state is for. 
That's what the state should be doing. And for reasons, I mean, for reasons in my view, which have to do precisely with supporting liberalism and democracy. If, you, if economic inequality, if, though it's not poverty is bad, but in, inequality is bad in two special ways. One way that inequality is bad is that it makes it impossible to see the future. And this is interesting, right? You can think of America as a laboratory. We have a lot of very rich people, and they think about the future all the time. Unfortunately, they think about the future in ways which are totally idiotic. And because they're so rich, nobody can say it to them, right? So they say things like, I'm gonna live forever. They're not gonna live forever. They say things like, I'm gonna to go to Mars. I'm gonna build a platform in the Pacific Ocean and live there without government regulations, right? We all have bunkers in New Zealand. Like, so they have ideas about the future, but their ideas about the future are dumb. Meanwhile, that takes up all the space, and people who don't have money, right, don't get to talk about the future, and there's no discussion of the future. Or to put it a different way, when you, when you have a billion dollars, um, the, truth is, the truth is not enough for you, but when you don't, when you have nothing, the truth is too much for you. This is my second point. Inequality is also epistemic. When inequality gets to be too great, it's not just that the, about the future, it's that there's no possibility for actual communication. And democracy and liberalism both assume the possibility of public communication. So for those reasons, having a future and having communication, in getting rid of inequality or addressing inequality is, is, extremely, is extremely important. And by the way, I don't think it's a coincidence that the countries which are most unpredictable, Russia, the US, the UK, are also the countries which are most unequal. I think those things are causally connected. Okay, and then the final thing is about um, collective action. And here I, I completely agree. I think collective action is, and this is I think a place where Paul and I overlap um, in our debts to or our readings of some of the Czech thinkers of the 70s and 80s. So let's start from China. What does Chinese censorship focus on? Chinese internet censorship does not prevent you from having your own thoughts. Where Chinese censorship clamps down really fast is the moment where you try to organize a march or a protest, right? Actual action which involves physical human beings coming to the same place for a common purpose, that's where they immediately shut you down, right? And that's, I mean, that's a general feature, right? Does Mr. Putin like having people on the streets? No. Does Mr. Trump like having people on the streets? No, right? I mean, this is a difference from the fascism of the 20s and 30s. Fascism of the 20s and 30s liked having people on the streets. Of course, people back then were a lot more physically fit and they looked better in those uniforms, right? Um, than, than a lot of Mr. Trump supporters would, if I can put it that way. But, but, um, but, but there's, a, there's a difference, which is that it's, it's, it's a negative motive. It's, a, it's like a demobilization. A lot of what censorship is about is keeping you very angry or let's not call it censorship, let's, talk, let's just call it information manipulation. It's about keeping you very angry on your couch. Angry and isolated. And the only answer to that is actual collective action because actual collective action, A, gives you a chance to see that the world is not really us and them, and B, it gives you a chance at factuality. You know, the more you get out in the world, the better chance you have at factuality. So on collective action, I agree completely with Pavel. I should leave it there, thanks. So thank you, Tim. Uh, I hadn't actually realized that uh, Pavel had asked that many questions, but uh, that was fantastic. <laughs> so I promised in the beginning to all of you that uh, we will have time for a Q&A. And if I want to keep that promise, this is the time to have it. So we start right away. For your, it's time for your comments. Martin will be the first. Do you want this? No, no. Martin. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Martin Paloš. I'm from Prague, but I have uh, come from the United States uh, this morning. And I'm coming from Miami, from Florida, where I teach at Florida International University. So my question will be very concrete. Cubans. Uh, Cubans is a small uh, nation, insular nation, living on a small island, and I am in touch in this context with many, many Cuban dissidents. 
Obviously, Cuban dissidents uh, found some inspiration in our 1989 revolutions, but they are maybe confused, as all of us are, with the state of the world 2018. I understand that identity for each of us is an ambiguous thing. On the one hand, it's something universal, because each of us is participating in it. I don't know whether you have some comment on the most recent book by Frank Fukuyama, uh, published this year on identity, which I think is extremely interesting. But going back to Cubans, we all are part of our concrete situation. And uh, Cuban uh, government is, I would say, very specific uh, uh, variety of that larger uh, species you have just so eloquently described. These people are dying for democracy. They would like uh, to do something, but the world is not responding as it was responding to us uh, uh, more, almost 30 years from now. Any comments? Uh, because they read Patochka, they read Havel, and it's not enough. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Martin. I am not from philosophical faculty, uh, uh, but I have I have, quest uh, I have question uh, about uh, uh, young uh, university people in um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, big European countries. I have a friend in uh, France. Um, Spain and and uh, and England, all my all my friend suffered uh, extreme left parties like uh, 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 and uh, don't trust in f in f in f uh, in f uh, in political elites. Uh, and uh, and uh, think and thinking seriously about social uh, rev revolution uh, and are and are really skeptical about benefits from uh, go uh, capitalist globalization. Thank you very much for many uh, thoughts and quest. So since we are at university, we need a student's question as well. Come on. James, you're not the typical student. <laughs> My name is Matthew. I study here at Charles University. I study history. I'd like to ask you what you think about trigger warnings in the United States and a suppression of freedom of speech in, uh, in American universities. Thank you. Maybe one more. Hello, uh, my name is Alexandra, and I do you have a question? You, you said that no one stood up for democracy uh, after the financial crisis in 2008, and I would like to know your thoughts about Time's Up movement and uh, the entire environment movement, if that would be, uh, in your opinion, something you know, in this direction. Thank you. And the one in front of you, there was another question. Yeah. And then we stop it here. Okay? Hello, can I just say, you know, thank you so much. It's it's excellent discussion, civil. You know, I, I really love it. it. It's a moment of delight for me. Uh, my question is um, um, on. You, you're talking about you know, we're losing the sense of, of future, and there are people who have very concrete sense of future, fundamentalists of all different sorts. And so, where does this leave us in terms of you know um, secularism, which has been you know moving forward, and, and these guys you know with very clear future, are, are they going to be a threat? And, and what, what's the um, what's the future in, in, in this regard? Thank you. Okay, so some of these were some. I'm going to just respond in a general way because not all of these were formulated as, as, as questions. Um, with, Q, with Cuba, I mean, I have no special insight into Cuba. My, my general sense is that with both the United States and Europe, we provide a positive example when we're not aware we're providing a positive example. 
and we provide a positive example when we have our own houses in order. So, of course, the United States is now a rather confusing example, um, not just for Cubans, but for pretty much everyone, for all kinds of reasons that I don't have to detain you, know, detain you with. What I, what, I think, what I think one has to be able to do with respect to Cuba or with respect to anywhere, and this, I think, has general importance, if we like democracy, or whatever it is, we have to be able to make a positive argument for it. I think, I mean, we got into the habit in the, in the 80s and 90s and the early 21st century of thinking, well, everyone understands why democracy is good, but the polling data, especially of this demographic right here, suggests that no, not everybody thinks that democracy is such a good idea. Um, so I think, and, and we also fall into the habit of thinking, well, since democracy is inevitable, it must be good. I mean, for me, this is one of the ironies of 1989, is that one determinist story went away and we immediately fastened on to another determinist story, which says, well, since there's capitalism, there must be democracy, which of course is just as wrong as since there's capitalism, there has to be socialism. They're both wrong. I mean, they're equally wrong. They're parallel wrong. And often the same people believe first one and then the other one. Um, so I think we have to be able to make, this, this is my, my answer, I think we have to be able to openly and kind of naively make, make ethical arguments on behalf of these things. Uh, I mean, with respect to your friends and, and, and revolution, I'm not, I'm not quite sure where we were, I'm not quite sure where that was going. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure, no, no, don't, 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 don't no, I want to guess. Um, I, 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 so I don't know what it means to be against the elites, right? Because, you know, it, when democracy works, as for example, like in the regional elections in Poland, a couple of weeks ago, or in the American midterms, all kinds of people run for office who hadn't run for office before. And many of them will have very different ideas than the people who were just in office. And what I worry about with, like, with the distinction between the elites and everybody else is that we then overlook that basic procedural function that democracy can serve of getting people who hadn't been in any kind of an elite, really, or very only very moderately so, into positions of responsibility, especially at lower levels. I and mean, one of the ways that the Democratic Party in the U.S. went completely wrong was that it's, it only believed in winning at the top and didn't believe in winning at the bottom. It stopped caring about the most local offices. And so, you know, I think being on the left means like running for mayor of your town um, it, 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 and not only talking about the global elites who run everything, although, of course, global elites run everything. I mean, it, 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 I think being on the left means a kind of, much, means much more local involvement, especially on issues of, of, of factuality. What I, what I really miss on, on the left, and I think this is one of the places where the left should say, I'm, you know, the far left anyway should say, I'm sorry and move on, um, is with factuality. Because it turns out that if you don't believe in factuality, the oligarchs win. Because the oligarchs, the, a big secret, the oligarchs own the television stations or, or the newspapers. Um, and, and the far left doesn't, right? And so, the, and so if your position is, we don't believe in truth, the, and the other people are the ones who have the, who have the spotlights, you know, then, 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 then we lose. Uh, free speech. I'm a big believer in free speech. Um, I'll tell you what I'm not a big believer in, though. I'm not a big believer in everybody having the right to say whatever they want in every possible forum, right? So, for example, let's say I want to go to the General Motors annual board meeting um, and talk about global warming. I would love to do that, right? <laughs> Am I going to get to do that? No, because that's not what free speech means. So one of the things which is happening on American campuses, as you probably know, is that right-wing groups find the most objectionable person they can think of, like, for example, a Nazi pedophile, and that is a true example. And they say, if you don't invite our favorite Nazi pedophile to your campus, that proves that you don't care about free speech. And this is, of course, a trap for universities because universities then feel very guilty and they think, oh, well, of course we should be in favor of free speech, maybe we should invite that Nazi pedophile. And some people do and some people don't. But what I'm trying to say is that the whole thing is a bit of a trap. Caring about free speech isn't the same thing as feeling like you have to invite the most objectionable possible character to give a talk at your university, right? Charles University, for Charles University to prove that it cares about free speech doesn't mean it has to invite the worst possible people to give talk, I mean, you know. <laughs> And that's, that's, not, that's not what free speech means. Tr trigger warnings. I'm not, are you all familiar with the concept of a trigger warning? So I should just, I mean, I teach in an American university, and I have encountered the concept, I mean, this is my job, I've encountered the concept of a trigger warning only outside of my own university. I've never actually encountered it in daily life. So 
I know what it's supposed to mean, but I don't know what it would mean in practice. I teach, I teach the Holocaust. I teach things that are very difficult. It wouldn't occur to me to tell people you should be careful. The Holocaust is a, different, is a difficult subject, right? Of course it is. So I don't, you know, I don't, so for me, I don't, I don't, I mean, maybe you come from a university where there is such thing as trigger warnings and safe spaces. I have never encountered either a trigger warning or a safe space except beyond my university as an abstraction. So it's not something that I've ever, ha ever had to, re to react to. But my, my basic reaction is I, I think free speech is incredibly important. And what I worry about is, is, is people who use the concept of free speech against it. Because in my country, anyway, the universities are one of the very few places where free speech is actually possible. And of course, free, one of the things free speech means is students get to say lots of stupid stuff, right? That's what, yeah, right? That's what free speech means. It means students get to say lots of stupid stuff. It's very important to be able to say stupid stuff. What's not so cool is when people, you know, take their phones and record students saying stupid stuff and then say, oh, look, this student is stupid. Universities are crazy. Let's shut them down. Let's defund them, right? That's, in my view, not so good. That's not a defense of free speech. That's the kind of thing which happens in the United States. But universities, from, I mean, the reason why I think universities get attacked for free speech is because they're the only place where we have free speech. When, once you go on to the business world, you graduate Yale, you go on to the business world, you don't, ha you don't have free speech in your office, right? So I, I think the, re the very reason people attack universities is because there actually is free speech on campus. And free speech includes the right to be wrong on, on all kinds of things. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. There are plenty of people who reacted to 2008 by, pro by, by protesting. I mean, it was the, big the, biggest, the biggest protest in the United States since the Iraq War. There are plenty of groups like the Indignados and like Occupy Wall Street. Um, what I meant was, and you're absolutely right, what I meant was there was no, there was no movement at the level of state policy comparable to what happened in the 1930s after the Great Depression. So, I mean, the American, the American reaction to 2008 was to bail out the banks. And we spent an unbelievable amount bailing out the banks. And we're, every year, we're still spending a huge amount bailing out the banks. Um, not sending anybody to prison, but bailing out the banks. The, the, we, while we bailed out the banks, we could have bailed out a whole lot of other things. Like, we could have bailed out the newspaper industry for an insignificant fraction of what it costs to bail out the banks, but we, but we didn't. Um, we just bailed out the banks. That's not, in my view, a, you know, a poli that's what I meant. That like nobody had an ideological reaction to 2008 the way that I think that we ought to have done at the level of state policy. And it does loop back around to many of the reactions. So with Occupy Wall Street, with which I had a certain amount of contact, part of the problem was they didn't have, they often didn't have a clear idea, going back to your question a bit, as to what the state should do. I mean, because I think of, see, I think of oligarchy as right-wing anarchism. Right. For me, oligarchy is right-wing anarchism. Oligarchy, says, oligarchy is like an extreme version of neoliberalism, which says the state should not intervene where I have my offshore bank accounts. Right? That's right-wing right anarchism. And there's a way that right-wing anarchism can actually make a friendly marriage with left-wing anarchism, when people on the left don't have any idea what the state should do. Right? I mean, in my view, what the state should do is it should be tracking down the offshore bank accounts. That's what the state should be doing. Then we finish up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. So secularism, where, where was the secularism question? Could you just raise your hand? Oh, sorry. Um, very big question. I, ra I raise timescapes, and so it's my fault. But in, in, for most of the time that we've had humanity, people have thought in cyclical terms whether it's about the return of a set of gods or the return of a golden age. Cyclical thought is actually, cyclical temporal thought is totally typical, whether it's religious or not. For me, a very interesting thing about the 18th century was the creation of historical time, which when it was created was self-consciously created. That is, people were perfectly aware that they were reacting not only against religion, but also against Plutarch and the Renaissance. Like, because the Renaissance is the idea that we can bring things back from the Romans and then the Greeks. The, when, when historical time was created, it was, people were aware that they were doing something which was against the Renaissance, as well as against the Reformation, against both, right? So the, the Enlightenment was actually against both the Reformation and the Renaissance simultaneously. I don't have an easy answer to your question, except that, to say that I think democracy requires historical time. Because democracy, in order to care about democracy, you have to believe that you can learn from the past, do something in the present, like vote, which will change the future. And that also democracy, once you get it going, has the virtue that it tends to produce historical time, unlike other political systems. 
Um, but it's, I think it's just a fight that has to be fought. I think there's no magic. I mean, if you care about democracy, I think, it's a, I think the fight for time is a fight that has to be fought. Good afternoon, Kamal Uvin speaking. Mr. Snyder, uh, first of all, happy Thanksgiving. And my question is, can America still provide template for successful democracy? Thank you. Hello, my name is Teresa. I'm from Palatsky University from Olomouc. And uh, firstly, thank you for all of your books. I think they are great. And secondly, I have a question. You said that uh, you think that uh, Trump is a very skilled politician. Uh, are you serious? <laughs> Because uh, I'm not sure if he making his all of these uh, decisions consciously or he's just manipulated by his, I don't know, co-workers. What, what do you think of that? Thank you. Yeah, well, hello. Um, you were talking about uh, the elections and how they don't matter any, uh, mostly in Russia or Hungary. Uh, and I would like uh, to know how do you actually meant it in the case of Hungary, because yeah, we all know that elections in actu Russia actually doesn't matter at all. But the people in Russia, they know that and they don't come to them. They come less and less and the turnout is uh, lesser and lesser every year. But in Hungary, the people actually came to the elections and the turnout was the highest since socio socialism. And uh, they, sh they didn't have to come to the elections or they didn't have to vote for Orban. And even if you say that the media isn't free in Hungary, which I don't think is true, um, you can't deny that the people came freely to the elections and they spoke the will of the people. I mean, uh, thank you. Let's have one more. Uh, he has the mic and has the difficult choices. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Alexandra and I have a question referring to your last point on collective action and then referring to the actual uh, lecture on oligarchy including Russia and knowing that you're an expert in Holocaust in Ukraine. I was wondering what would be your future prediction in terms of Ukraine? If you talk about um, Maidan as a collective action movement, and if we talk about oligarchy and the fact that the, the country is being run by oligarchs, what would be your future prediction on Ukraine? Thank you. Okay, what was, so there was, U.S. template, what was the second, sorry, what was the second question? I can't read my own notes after, what, your, 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 the second question after your question, yeah, what was it again? Just run really quickly. Oh, okay, yeah, got it, got it, thank you. Okay, um, so the U.S. is a template, I mean, I, no, the U.S. should definitely not be anybody's template. Our, our, our constitution was written in the late 18th century, and by the standards of the late 18th century, it's a really impressive document. But by the standards of the 21st century, it really has a lot of shortcomings. I mean, there's things that we have, like the electoral college, or the possibility of gerrymandering, or the legality of voter suppression, which I just do not think are good examples for anybody. Um, so, I mean, I know I don't believe in templates for, for democracy. I think procedurally it's fine for people to cut and paste constitutions and to learn from one another, but I think substantially the argument for democracy can't be that it works for somebody else. I think the argument for democracy has to be that it's the best system, it's the best system for us. And I mean, I am, I'm really comfortable, I mean, it's a strange thing to say, but I'm very comfortable with, with the moment we're in now, where, it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm personally very uncomfortable, but I'm intellectually very comfortable with, with the moment we're in now, where everyone realizes that American democracy is flawed, because American democracy is flawed. And, but it's, 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 it's flawed in a way where one can learn not what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't allow unlimited money into politics. It's a mistake. Claiming that corporations are people and then letting them letting them pump money into elections makes no sense. So look and learn, right? Don't just don't do those things. There are a lot of good things about the U.S. system too. Um, but but I mean, I know I, I don't. I think you have to make the argument for democracy that it's the best. It's it's the best for you. Um, 
As for Mr. Trump being skilled, yeah, he's, I mean, I think it's very important to be respectful of people um, and, to be, and to be respectful of what they're actually good at. I, I, I don't think that Mr. Trump could have won an election in ordinary circumstances, but I do think that he has clear oratorical skills. His advisors are not the ones who, you know, who, I mean, some of the things like build the wall and, and lock her up, admittedly, those were like tested by robots over Facebook. He didn't invent those things. But his delivery of them is pretty good. You know, I mean, he, he, he's good at being a nihilist. He's good at not caring at all about ethics. Um, he's good at being a narcissist. Um, he's good at certain things that create a kind of overall package which has a, a kind of ability to resist reality. I mean, he has a certain kind of toughness. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't ever give in, right? So, so for example, I don't think he'll, he will never, I don't think he'll be, he'll have to be dragged from office. I mean, partly that's because he's a criminal and he knows he'll be prosecuted as soon as he gets out of office. We're in a very third world situation that way. But partly it's because he does have a kind of personal toughness, which comes from just not caring about the law or the truth or anything else. And I, I think it's important, that that's a moral vice, of course, but it's a certain kind of political skill. And he's a good communicator. He can give a speech. He can get up without notes and give a speech. He can, he can react to the way the audience feels. I mean, at his rallies, he was very effective. He was not effective in a way which I think, which I like, or which I think people, he does things that I don't think people should do, like encourage some people to beat other people. I think that's a bad idea. But he does it, you know, he, he knows how to do it. And I think one has to acknowledge that. I think it's, an, it, I think it's, it's a mistake to, it's a mistake to be, it's a mistake to be dismissive of him. I mean, as a businessman, we can dismiss him. He was a horrible businessman. But as a television personality, and as a politician, he actually ha he has a skill set. Um, that's what I would say. And, it's a, and, and I think the thing, and this goes towards, you know, it, 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 it's a, it, we have to see how his, if we want to be intellectually interesting, we have to see how his skill set in some way works together with the moment that we're in, which it does. I mean, he, his skill set works together with the moment in which we stare at screens. He's, he's very good at making us for either elated or very discouraged. And that's also what the internet does, right? The internet, social media make you happy, 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 happy. Oh, sad. I better look at it some more so I can feel happy again. Happy, happy, happy. Now I'm happy. Oh, sad. Right? That's how social media works. That's also how Mr. Trump works. He's, 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 a, man, he's a man who in some way fits into the moment. And so I did, I did actually mean it seriously. Uh, Orban. I mean... If you seriously think that you went to the elections in Hungary with the idea that somebody besides Mr. Orban's party was going to win, if you can like nod your head and say, yeah, I voted because I was sure that like these elections were really endowed and somebody besides Mr. Orban can win, then I'm willing to take the question seriously. Because that's what democracy means. Democracy means there are multiple parties who have a chance of winning. And the reason they have a chance of winning is because the playing, the playing field is fair, both with respect, with, elect, with respect to electoral finances, with respect to access to the airwaves and to media in general. Um, that's what democracy democracy means. It's pretty easy to get people fired up to get, have a high percentage. That's what you, you compare Russia and Hungary as if they're different. What you're describing in Hungary is exactly the way Russia was five years ago. And what you're describing in Russia now is the way Hungary is going to be in five years. It's as simple as that. Um, the notion that they, there were elections in Hungary where like the people came out and showed their will, I'm sorry, that's just not credible. In order, if you want to know what the people's will is, you have to have free media. And yes, I'm willing to contradict you, there are not free media in Hungary. There are, there are private media in Hungary which have a very, very small niche. There are a few reporters in Hungary who are doing their job extremely well, but they do not have access to the population in a way which would qualify so that you could say that Hungary has free media. So if the outcome is not in doubt, and you know it wasn't, if the outcome is not in doubt, then we're not really talking about a, a democracy. Um, and this is a problem above all for Hungarians. It's not, I mean, it's a, it's a problem secondarily for the European Union, but above all, it's a problem for Hungarians. If you know the way, if you know the way things are going to go now, perfect certainty now means perfect uncertainty later on, right? What does post-Orban Hungary look like? What, is, what does that constitutional setup look like with somebody else in charge? Um, it's hard to think of good alternatives. Okay, uh, Ukraine. So Ukraine is, I mean, in, in the book, we didn't talk about this at all, but in the book, Ukraine plays a very important part I'm looking for my Ukrainian question. It was over, yeah. Ukraine plays a very important part. Um, Ukraine for me, the Maidan for me is fundamentally anti-oligarchical politics. The Yanukovych government is an example of how, how Russia naturally draws other oligarchs towards it. Um, and, and the Maidan is interesting both in its kind of intuitive resistance to that, but also in, in some of its political practices, which included the economy of gift, 
which is something that people talk about in the left, but which never really exists, but it did exist on the Maidan, the economy of gift. So I looked at the Maidan as an example of an anti-oligarchical an anti collective practice. It, it, it's not the same thing as changing the system, but I think Ukraine is an example of holding off the worst, a little bit like the protests in Slovakia this year have been. And I think there's a lot to say for holding off the worst. I think there's a lot to say for taking risks in order to buy time. Um, because if things go much worse in Ukraine or much worse in Slovakia, then they're more likely to go much worse in Russia or much worse in the Czech Republic, or for that matter, much worse in the United States. I think it's, I think in some sense, it's all, it's all connected. I mean, I think much, so much of, much of what Americans have to say about Trump now has to do with investigative reporters in Ukraine. If you take away investigative reporting in Ukraine, then the American investigation of Trump is probably six months behind where it is right now. So I think these things matter. My, my, prediction, my prediction in Ukraine is that this is, we're in basically a West, West German, East German type situation. I think Ukraine is very flawed. Post-war West Germany was also very flawed. I think there has to be a generational transition in politics, just like there eventually was in West Germany. I think that the war in Ukraine in fact, ends in some time scale of decades, and it only ends when the non-occupied part of Ukraine is clearly a better country than the occupied part of Ukraine. So that's not a prediction. I mean, but that's that's how I, you know, that's that's my general sense of how things how things will go. I think you're absolutely right though that the issue in Ukraine was the rule of law. That was the issue in Ukraine. And by the way, U Ukrainians and Russians have the advantage over Czechs and other people who are members of the European Union that they see what the European Union is about. The European Union is about taking a flawed state and making it better. <laughs> That's what the European Union is about. Once you're inside the European Union, you say, hooray, we've always been great. But when you're outside the European Union, you know, whether it's Slovakia in the 1990s, um, you know, or Greece, in the, Greece or Spain in the 1980s, you're aware that the European Union is about taking a flawed state and making it better. Um, and that's why, you know, that's why the Maidan's political logic made sense. And that's, of course, why Russia tried to prevent Ukraine from getting closer to the European Union. So I'll make it short. Thanks uh, to all of you for uh, being uh, part of this debate and becoming an active part of this debate. Thanks again for Charles University for hosting us with this event today. And thanks most of all, and thank you very much to the two on stage here, Pavel Basha and uh, Timothy Snyder. Thank you.